All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, to give a quick introduction, um, this webinar today is actually hosted by both People Tech Partners and All Voices. All Voices is an employee feedback management platform or EFMP that empowers employees to anonymously provide feedback, ask questions, share positive inputs, and report harassment, bias, or culture issues directly to their company's leadership. So to provide a little context for our conversation today, through All Voices State of Employee Feedback 2021 report, 41% of employees have left a job because they didn't feel listened to, um, according to Gallup. Um, among actively disengaged workers in 2021, 74% are either actively looking for new employment or watching for openings. This compares with 55% of not engaged employees and 30% of engaged employees. So actively disengaged workers are definitely um, not looking to stay at their current companies. Um, and then we also want to celebrate that this month is Women's History Month and Employee Appreciation Day is tomorrow. So happy Employee Appreciation Day, everyone. <laughs> yep. And then with that, I will turn it over to our moderator, Lauren. Hi everyone, great to see you here. I see that we have a nice full room. Uh, my name is Lauren Eager. I'm a growth program leader over at People Tech Partners um, and really excited to be hosting this webinar with them. All Voices has been an incredible partner to People Tech. Um, they were part of our 2020 cohort. Um, so really excited to have them back and, and be engaging with them once again. We also have some awesome speakers, which I'll go ahead and introduce. Um, we'll kind of go around and you can just give me a, a brief overview and what you're excited about maybe uh, to talk about today. So Anne, do you want to start with you? Sure. Hey, everyone. Anne Jacoby. Um, great to see lots of participants here. She, her, hers. Um, I've been in business for over 15 years, building and scaling companies, and now run my own shop, Spring Street, which is really focused on organizational culture. So how do we inspire those innovative, connected, inclusive workplace cultures that we all crave? How do we actually do that in practice? Thanks, Anne. Thomas? Well, hey, everyone. I'm Thomas DeGemmett. Um, I'm head of talent at Turn River Capital. Um, Turn River Capital is a growth equity firm in San Francisco. Mid-market, um, we have we focus on B two B SaaS um, with about two billion dollars in assets under um, uh, management, and I look after all things talent, which means I get the really cool job of figuring out how to help our um, portfolio companies use different talent levers to drive their growth. Um, this is my first private equity job in college. If you'd asked me what I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to do business, but I, um, I knew the two things, I didn't know what I wanted to do in business, but I knew the two things I did not want to do in business, HR or finance. So the fact that I'm now like head of talent at a private equity firm is not lost on me, um, but the journey here has been a very fun one in lots of different spaces. I started off in management consulting with org strategy, the Boston Consulting Group, moved over into um, sales and go to market enablement and then product um, at LinkedIn, but focused on coaching and development. Um, had my own learning tech company, Tribe.ai. Um, it was actually a PTP um, company. So started as a, on the founder vendor side, and then eventually was lucky enough to come onto the advisor side as well. Um, and prior to this, I was uh, heading up L&D at ServiceNow. I'm glad to be here with you all. Okay, Ayana. Hi all, I'm Ayana Edwards. I'm the head of people at HackerOne where we focus on ethical hacking. Um, Thomas, I'm probably your nightmare. My background is actually in finance. I started my world in finance and somehow made it over to the people side of the world. Um, I've done it for large companies, uh, Citibank, Ultimate Software, which is now UKG, things like that. And now this is my first rodeo um, in an actual startup now scale up. And so it's definitely a different world, but I love it. Um, all thing people, anything that's going to make people better, I am responsible for. So I am responsible for the entire people team, but I take that responsibility to the heart. So it's not just at work, it's just naturally who I am. So I'm happy to be here and, and add to this discussion. So exciting. Before we get started, I think there are a couple of people who mentioned that we might be on speaker view. It might be easier if there's gallery view. Christine, I don't know if that's something we could make happen on the back end, but I just wanted to flag. Yep, it should be in a gallery view now, but panel uh, attendees, let me know if it's not. Cool. Great. 
So I think we want to start out by talking about authentic celebration. So Anne, this is a question for you. What does authentic celebration look like in practice at companies who are successfully retaining talent? Oh my goodness. Um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> and it, it really is so specific to the organizational culture, right? Uh, I think each team is unique. They're going to find what really feels resonant based on their culture, based on their organizing principles, based on really the makeup of the organization. But um, some that I've found have been really successful is, you know, things like scavenger hunts, um, things where people can get really engaged and and have it be a team experience, right? Escape rooms and all of this stuff, thankfully, can now be virtual as well. Um, you know, scavenger hunts have moved online, um, escape rooms have moved online. So there, there are ways to connect the different parts of your organization, especially global organizations, in a way that's authentic and fun and feels like a celebration. So those are just a few ideas. I think yeah, those I, are all great ideas. <laughs> Oh, I, I was just going to say, I love that. And first of all, I, I, I was making a mental note of some of the examples that you mentioned. I'm like, I think we can do those again now uh, when you mentioned escape rooms, which is awesome. Um, I just want to underscore the wisdom of what Anne said around this idea that it is specific to the organization. I think for me, it's always helpful to kind of go back to the why um, behind celebration. And, and at least in the organizations that I've led, it's ultimately usually about a mix of belonging um, and recognition, those very core human needs. And so the question is just always, what in for our unique org um, context is what our people need to feel like they belong and feel like who they are as individuals and their work and their teams are recognized. And then that flows into a, a million wonderful things um, like you were calling out it. That's great. And I honestly, I want to let Ayana talk for just a second. Um, I think maybe she could speak to empowerment because I think this kind of ties into it. Can you give an example of, of what empowerment looks like and what it is clearly not? Sure. Empowerment to me looks like getting behind someone, championing someone, whether they're in a room or not, and then giving them the freedom to authentically be themselves, right? And then supporting them in being themselves. And then when they're not being themselves, I like to say, fix their crown behind the scenes, right? So you you definitely want, a lot of times I think we for, we're so big on cheerleading, but we forget that in giving people the opportunity to up-level, to, to fail forward, if you will, sometimes we have to let them know that too. That's just as empowering and giving and providing empowerment um, as anything else. What empowerment is not is demanding someone to think like you or to see the world that you do the same way you do. Um, and not allowing them to, going back to, you'll hear me say this a lot because I'm very passionate about this, being authentic and letting them come to, to, the, to the table with who they are, right? So as a company, we, we've all had some kind of influence in hiring people. Trust who you hired. Trust who you hired and don't hire someone and then ask them to be someone that they're not. That's beautifully put. Um, thank you for that. Um, so moving on to metrics for a creative and innovative workplace. I think this is a question for Anne and Thomas. What do you think about the constellation of metrics that you can look at to say we're promoting an innovative and creative environment? What does that look like? So I'm sure Anne's going to have a much more sophisticated <laughs> answer than I do. I'm like, if those are your goals, ask the people who you hope it is creative and innovative, how creative and innovative it is. Like, I think there are a number of um, theoretical leading indicators that you might look to, but ultimately, like I go back to your employee voice survey and I'm like, what do your people think? Um, and I think obviously the devil's in the details. What do you mean by a creative um, and innovative environment? Kind of what are the things that you would expect to see that um, if that were true? So I think there's some of that that you wanna make sure you're measuring. For example, um, one of our values, um, certainly at Turn River, is deep creativity, but the way that we measure that, the reason for that, um, is we ultimately believe that we win as a team and that the ideas that we create together are going to be better than what any one person can bring on their own. And so the a lagging indicator metric for that is if we're doing this right, any of our key performance indicators should look better this year than they did last year. And if we end up trending down, it's like, where, where did we get that wrong? So I think there's figuring out what those are, but ultimately I think it starts with, from a culture perspective, just asking. 
Beautifully put, Thomas. Um, and I love the focus that key performance indicators can give us. Um, it really explicitly says, this is what we value here. This is what's important to us. We all may get there to Ayana's point in a different way, in a different path. The how may, may look different. And that's really where the creativity comes, comes into play. I mean, I think I work with a lot of organizations that are trying to be more creative, that are trying to innovate. And we've got to focus on rewarding those kinds of behaviors. And that doesn't mean just celebrating the things that go well, right? It means mm -hmm. celebrating the things that we try and celebrating the experiments that we run. And so I think mm -hmm. if you look at it as a constellation of, of metrics, which I often do, it's, hey, how many ideas did we introduce? How many experiment, experiments did we run? Like how many things did we actually try as a team? And then, hey, what mm -hmm. was actually adopted? What worked? What didn't work? Let's celebrate all of it because we really wanna reinforce those behaviors. And I think that's kind of the gotcha is sometimes we get so fixated on celebrating what's successful, we really need to celebrate the whole process. And that's how we really change culture. It's an exciting thing to yeah. think about. Um, that's one really quick note on that, um, just Anne, just, I love it. And something that unfortunately I've actually struggled to bring into the culture at some of my later places, but just an example, one of the places that I saw that be really real, um, on one of my teams at LinkedIn, we would actually meet every Wednesday and we'd go around and one person on the team had to share away the big fail in the last month. Um, and we were it explicitly was a moment to celebrate that because we said in order to fail, you had to have tried. Um, and I've not been able to get a place to do that as explicitly, but I, you know, Ayana and Anne, if you guys have any ideas on other ways, I think we talk a lot about celebrating failure, but I often kind of struggle to see like, what would that actually look like in an org? So that was mine, but I, I'm curious if you guys have seen any other models that work. Um, I, it's not so much the model. I will add to that. It's who's modeling that behavior. Mm. Um, and so like, I'm the queen of like, listen, if, if my team did great, they did it. If they, they messed up, I did it type situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm starting to watch how those behaviors are being modeled. I don't, I don't have an issue admitting that failure. I probably speak about my failures way quicker than I will speak about my, uh, you know, anything I've done well. And, but in those failures, I'll always share, what have I learned? What can we do better? again i'm really big about fail forward and so i think it's who might be modeling it not so much how do you enforce the model that might be helpful as well yeah i know that um rumor has it that google has one dedicated day where they celebrate all the failed ideas and kind of pay homage to them it's a great way of kind of tipping your cap to hey we tried this and it, it was a big flop but hey we tried it and that's that holds value yeah yeah Great idea. I'm taking notes on these, by the way. <laughs> I took a note on that one. <laughs> so speaking of those, like when you're talking about conflicts and failures and, and letting everything be celebrated at an organization, how have you seen healthy conflict and hard conversations manifest at thriving organizations? And I would love to hear from, from any and all of you. Um, I could take that one. I've been known to give difficult conversations very well, which is what I don't know what that says about me. But um, um, I think it starts with um, leading with empathy. Um, and in our organization, you're allowed, again, to be authentic, to be yourself, and understanding that from leadership, CEO down, no one's afraid to say we messed up. And so, and everyone also make sure you understand that we're here for you to succeed. And so the reason why we're giving you this difficult conversation is because we want you to, to succeed. I'll give you a prime example. Um, in my past lives, when you put someone on a PIP, it was really typically to manage someone out. For us, it's for us, our, our, our intent is really for performance. It's really just to course correct a bit. And so to know that you're working in an organization where people care enough about you, that the idea is not to manage you out, the idea is to course correct, right? We wanna make sure that you're, you're going, you kind of fell off a little bit. And so now we're just putting some guidelines, giving you some direct you know, um, rules to follow or, or action items to show, to remind you and us that you're the greatness that we hired. And so I think that was, that's a, to me, a, a, you know, I have to shout out how for one for that. I think it's a great way to kind of lead into or lean into those conversations and create that atmosphere where you don't have to be afraid of a difficult conversation, right? So. I love that, Ayana. And I'll, I'll just say, you know, what comes to mind for me is when you think about psychologically safe workplaces, which I think we're all trying to cultivate, conflict happens, right? It's not the avoidance of conflict. It's actually the mature, direct, addressing conflict and doing so in a way that's respectful and constructive, but not holding back 
kind of, hey, I, I see things differently. And then you have it out, right? You have open, really healthy discussion about it. And then you move on, you move through it. Um, and I think that's the sign of a really strong, healthy workplace culture is that ability to, to direct it, directly mm -hmm. address it. That's one, um, both of those answers. Um, and I would add that when I see um, organizations um, navigate conflict the best, now this is particular to like conflict, different points of opinion versus kind of a, a tough uh, performance conversation. But when um, organizations navigate conflict the best, the goal is to figure out what do we need to do to commit to a direction, not what do we need to do to all agree. Mm -hmm. um, I think very often, like people get stuck at the point of conflict because there's this assumption that everybody in the room has to like feel, see the world exactly the same way for us to move forward, which basically only incentivizes us to create a bunch of yes men, right? Like that's fundamentally what, what is going to happen there. Um, but we, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the concept of disagree and commit. Um, at some point, we're gonna need to go in a direction and we will not necessarily go in that direction because everybody agrees it's the direction to go. But all of us know that more important than the direction that we pick is that we are going in the same direction. And so we will disagree and commit. And part of what I think the, the beauty of the disagree and commit model is one person agrees to go, I mean, commits to going in a direction that they would not agree with. But I think the other person agrees to be held accountable to certain metrics around that direction and what's the path of course correction. Um, because this is the beauty of what we do is it's this multi-play game um, is the honest truth of, of what we do, the craziness of these hyper growth environments that we're in means that like much to our chagrin, very few decisions are permanent. Very few structures last more than six months. Most times that feels really frustrating, but I think in conflict, it's actually this beautiful thing, right? We are always going to be coming back. And so how do we figure out what we need? And um, I've just had incredible partnerships with the people who I knew cared enough to support me even when they didn't agree with the direction I was going because they supported me. Um, and when I think about an empowering and kind of celebratory environment, those are, those are some of the peak ones um, that I've, I've experienced. I think that's so profound, Thomas. And I mean, just plus a thousand to all of that. I think leaders need to model those kinds of behaviors. I think we've all probably in our careers observed the leader that, oh yeah, in the meeting they say they're on board, but then behind, you know, behind the backs of their fellow leaders, they're kind of dissing the idea. And it's so toxic. It just completely tears down all of that great work that is done in that discussion of dissenting opinions, dissenting, dissenting voices, which is so important to invite. Um, you really do need to commit to your point, Thomas, um, even if you disagree. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. Um, Going back to this idea of celebrating, what are some tactical examples as managers um, of successful ways that you celebrate your team? And then past that, how do you translate that into a remote first world? And Thomas, as you're saying, these things are changing all the time. So what is your plan of action for that moving forward? I, I, I'll, I'll go really quickly, and, and by, I'm, this is one of those places I'm going to take copious notes. So please, I, on that, and I want to hear oh, your answers okay. as well. I, I don't think, uh, because I'll be honest, um, there are many things that I think our firm is really great at. Um, celebrating is something that we are growing in. Um, so by no means am I speaking from a place of, of kind of expert and mastery on this. Um, I can let you know the three things this year that we're doing to make that happen. Um, the first is really explicitly in how we think about giving feedback and making it very, very clear that like there is a, what, are, what do you wanna, what is one thing you wanna celebrate about this person in addition to all the general feedback that you've given so that everybody kind of gets that mirror of like, here's what that is. And what then can always, I think for most of us is a bit of a stressful time that performance review season is laced with points of celebration. Um, no matter where we're going in. I think that's the first. Um, the second um, is really kind of practicing some of that quarterly, what are the wins that we want to celebrate as a team? We actually are lucky enough to still be at a size where at least at the fund, we can come together on a weekly basis. And we do have a moment where kudos are able to be sent around. One of the things I'm going to steal though, um, 
from this um, and, and is, you know, we don't do a good job of celebrating the failures um, as much as we probably could. So, so how could we um, pull those in? Um, and then the third piece, um, and, you know, both Ayana and Anne have said this a number of times, it is so important that this is modeled from the top. And so there's a real ask for our senior leaders to figure out who on the team weekly are they reaching out to personally, not in the big, like I'm doing it in there, kind of on Slack to thank them for something that they've seen and done and celebrate them that way. Because at the end of the day, there's, I think there's no replacement for that human to human, I see you and I see what you're contributing. But, but that's some of what we're trying. Um, we are definitely on the journey. Sure. At HackerOne, we have some tactical, we have Slack channels dedicated to this. So we have a milestone Slack channel. So this Slack channel is every time someone gets a promotion, we're seeing it a lot right now, you know, and it, it's in interesting how it's motivating others to be like, I want to be on the, you know, I want to get a, a promotion so I could be on the Slack channel. Um, we have a high five channel, right? And so anyone can high five anyone just because, and some of these high fives, I'm like, wow, they really high five. I was like, I must be the worst boss because I would never think to high five someone for that. Sounds like they're doing their job, but, you know, but, but honestly, it's great to hear. It's great to hear that people are really high fiving, you know, things like that. Um, and those are really tactical. You'd be surprised, you know, a lot of times we get so caught up in the larger, you know, it's important, the feedback that's a given, of course, but some of these smaller every day, um, just, I see you, I hear you. Um, one of the things I'm more so finding out, especially after going through performance reviews, is taking the time as a leader to understand what motivates your individual people, right? Because sometimes it's not that bonus. And you thought you just went to finance and fought real hard and got this person this bonus. And they're like, thanks, but I really feel hurt that you didn't say out loud that I, you know, I did this well, you know? So it's taking the time to understand your team and, and understand their key motivators and what's really going to encourage those those um, those behaviors to continue those good behaviors to move forward. I see someone here, Linda, you just said coffee chats. We have that as well. We we have what we call donuts and they kind of go across the organization and it gives people the opportunity to really get to interact with someone that you typically wouldn't interact with as well. So yeah, things like that. Those are definitely some tactical um, things that we do that really seems to be, and again, it's part of our culture and it's part of who we are and it's really, it becomes, way more influential when you're trying to influence behaviors, believe it or not, than your typical motivators. Ayana, I love that is so, so much um, kind of in sync with my mindset about personalization is so important. So whether it's, yeah, that public recognition, a promotion, a spot bonus, um, you know, privately sharing specific stories of what they do well or what their strengths are. Um, also, you know, if you have a budget to actually gift people something, you know, make it personal, you know, go that extra step to give them a yoga mat, you know, mm -hmm. give them a new cat collar if they're crazy about their cats, you know, just really making it personal shows that you care that you're really invested as them as humans. Um, mm -hmm. And it just, it, it just reinforces this sense of celebration that's unique to the individual. I think that's really important. Um, team celebration. I'm a big fan of actually having a team meeting to talk about how you want to celebrate, right? Um, get people to submit their own ideas. You know, chances are, and this is always the case with me, people have better ideas than I have. So I wanna invite in, you know, more <laughs> ideas across the group and have everyone decide on it. Um, and then, you know, the final thing is celebrating things, small things about well-being. So celebrating turning off your computer at 6 p.m. or celebrating, hey, I actually took PTO. You know, I read somewhere that a company is actually giving a spot bonus after you take your PTO. I mean, imagine that. So think about the behaviors that you want to reinforce culturally and then reward that. Uh, I think a lot of times we get caught up again in achieve, 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 where we actually want to be celebrating having more balance in our lives or, or having those work boundaries. Which is sometimes an achievement too, Anne. <laughs> sometimes that's, that's achieving as well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, um, I think this has been great. Let, let's talk about building trust. Um, how do you continue to build trust internally as an HR people team? Um, I personally just allow people to continue to be authentically themselves. If you want to come to me and today you're having a day, you need to curse, you need to say some inappropriate foolishness, of course, within boundaries, because sometimes I was like, hey, hey, I'm still HR, so I need you to, you know, I can't do that. But um. Just, and then them knowing that it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. It's in a vault. 
I'm not judging you for it. I'm not holding it against you. I'm not sharing this with anyone. And if I do, if it does get to something I need to share, I ask permission first. Hey, I hear this. I hear there may be a conflict here or something great here. Do you mind if I share this information? And so allowing employees to feel in control of their journey, especially with the people team. I, and I also like to alert them. I said, no one likes, you know, people think of HR as the police and often, quite often it's the employees forcing us to police you. So if you don't do these things, we won't police you. I promise you. I said, listen, HR people are humans too. Listen, we do things too, you know? So trust me, we understand what it means to be a human at work. We are humans, we're not robots, but don't put us in the predicament that forces us to take away that fun, enduring, loving side of HR, which is what we want to give to you and have to police you. We don't like policing either, trust me. It's a lot of paperwork, nobody likes it. Um, so um, I just, and, and I stay authentic as Diana, you catch me at work, as Diana, you're gonna catch me outside of work. Is like, I'm, you know, and so I let them see that I'm a human too. And, you know, yes, I do things outside of work that, you know, I don't know what they think HR people do or that they think we just live in a box for some reason. But, you know, I let people know, hey, I'm a person too. So when we make these decisions, I'm making it from a place of empathy, understanding I've been there. Um, not so much of, you know, it's because I said so or because this is the policy we have to follow and so forth. Yeah, plus one to being human. I mean, gosh, if there was a time to be human, it is now. <laughs> we are all about being human. Um, and I think it's about showing that vulnerability and showing those parts of yourself so that people feel more comfortable. Hey, I'm dealing with this issue. I'm going to come to you because I know that it's safe to talk about it. Sure. Um, plus one um, on all of those things. I think as you think about HR as a function, um, in addition, so kind of how do you build trust from a function perspective? You know, one of the best pieces of advice I've never forgotten that I got from one of my early career mentors um, way too many years ago um, was as you think about building trust, um, um, it's, it's, it, trust is basically a function of integrity. And integrity is really say what you do, do what you say, say what you did. Um, and I think we often um, miss the, the edges of that. Um, of the side of that. I think be upfront and clear. Here are the things that we as a function are committing to. Here's why we're committing to doing those things. Do the things that you said you would um, and deliver on them and then come back, share where we failed, share what we did well. I think very often the opaqueness um, of the HR function is one of the things that is our biggest inhibitance to trust. And by virtue, a lot of the stuff that we work on is um, confidential. So this is not about like going into all of these people's details, but being really clear, what is the org you're trying to build? Why are you trying to get there? And what are the things that you're going to do? And I just find if you can be a function that people know they can rely on to work on those things, people are very, very forgiving and understanding as you work through a lot. Um, and in our world, um, so we work on buyouts. Um, so typically I'm coming in at a place where there's just been an M&A. You have a bunch of people who've just been acquired. There's probably no more stressful time in general. And then especially in terms of how people look at the HR function. And yet again and again, I find people are incredibly gracious if they can just trust that you are going to say what you mean and mean what you say with them. Beautiful. Going off that, um, we've been talking about building trust and, and giving feedback a lot and moving on to, you know, empowerment. Can you give an example of what empowerment looks like and what it is clearly not and how those tie into to giving feedback um, and building trust within your organization? I keep thinking about this difference between the why, the what, and the how, you know, and really anchoring around the why. Like, why are we here as a, as a team? You know, what's our purpose? Um, really starting with that kernel of, of the why and the what. Uh, and then the how is all about empowerment, right? How you're going to get this done is up to you. Um, you know, you have a container and you have a space to play in. Um, this is what we're getting towards, but I'm going to leave it to you to figure out the best path. And I'm here for you if you need me, but I hired you for a reason, you know, and, and I'm really trusting you to get this done in the way that, that you think it, it needs to get done. So I think to me, that's what empowerment means. 
Yeah, I, I was thinking the exact same thing, um, Anne. And I just really want to underscore, you already said it, but like how important that is. Um, and actually this harkens back to um, um, Ayana, what you opened with when you were talking about kind of what your hopes were for us in terms of the idea of empowerment being around keep giving people ownership over the how, but really making sure that they have the tools in order to get there. And sometimes those tools are constructive because it's like, here's what I don't see in your pocket in order to get there. Um, but I do think it is, taking on, at least the way I think of it as a leader, it is making sure that at least when it comes to the how, you're the best supporting actor, is how I sometimes like to describe it. My job is to make you shine. You tell me what you need in order to do that. I'm going to let you know what I see from my perspective is coming in there, but you you are in the driver's seat in order to get there. And quite frankly, what I, what I often find is part of that empowerment is for the sake of the growth of the employee, et cetera. But I think increasingly in our world, and I used to, I used to mention this on the axis of seniority, i.e. the more senior you get, literally just the less visibility you're going to have into the day to day. And so actually quite frankly, the less equipped you are to even define the how. So it's a pretty like not great um, strategy, but I think in a remote world, now this is true for all of us. We just literally do not have the day to day observation in those cases to quite frankly have anything particularly um, intelligent to say about the specifics how of how people get their job. And so for me, empowerment is kind of letting go of our need for that control over that piece of it. And instead getting really clear, I love that on the why and on the what or the outcomes. And then really saying like, how do we support you to get there? I don't think I can add anything better. So I'm gonna skip on that one. Those two, you both put that so well. So I will, I'm gonna- We were riffing off of you, so. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> It's all derivative of you, Ayana. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. Um, we have a couple of questions, so I just figured I would go on on those. So, what are your thoughts on performance reviews? Are they are they actually positive? Is there a different approach that we can take to make them more positive? What are your thoughts, generally speaking? Um, I might be biased because I like feedback, good, bad, or in between. Um, so. I think when done properly, they're a great tool to continue to enhance people's growth. But what here's what I mean by done properly. Nothing on a performance review should ever be a shock to anybody, not the leader, not the employee, not the people above or below, like nothing should be a shock, which means that you've one fostered a, a interaction and, a, and a, a relationship between each other where you can continuously give healthy, productive feedback. Um, the performance review is just an opportunity to kind of bring it all together to say, hey, this is what we said we wanted to do. These were our goals. Here's what we did well. Here's what we didn't. And, hey, by the way, here's the extra stuff that you did that we didn't even think about. And let's celebrate those as well. Um, from a functional perspective, also how, and I'm curious if someone else has a better way to justify how do we reward those behaviors? Because that's also a way, I mean, truth of the matter is a lot, as much as there's a lot of research that people say they try to separate performance from compensation, the truth of the matter is they're not separated. And so there's, if compensation is done properly, it's not supposed to be a tool to hold people back. It's supposed to motivate them forward. It's supposed to say, I want you to know, this is a tangible way for me to show you that I see you. I see the work that you have done or have not done. And here's how we're going to reward that. And so they kind of go hand in hand, but again, it should not be a place of fear or of concern or worry or a weapon. It should be something that continues to empower people to move forward if done properly. So that's why I'm partial to performance reviews, but I know some people have some other opinions. So I'd love to hear that. Um, I, can share, I, can, I can go next with you, Anna. I wanna make sure I hear from you there. So, you know, I think there's a lot of science um, that increasingly is kind of going anti the, the performance review world. Um, but, but actually, I, and I'm, as I believe, I believe in the science, but I firmly believe that performance reviews, and I'm actually with you, are a very useful thing if done right, but like 99.9% .9 of the time they're not done right. And so that, that, you know, in many ways, I think what we're seeing in the science is people giving up after multiple tries. But I think often the reason that they're not done right is we focus on the least important part of the process, which is what is scored in a system. Really, the whole point of a performance review is to encourage, I think, two things. 
A moment of reflection and a conversation. A moment on reflection on what we've done, what our goals were, how we did against those, where we want to go next, and an alignment conversation to make sure that a manager and an employee are seeing the world in the same way so that they have a deliberate path forward. I think what often happens is like in an ideal world, that is that is what that whole system is meant to employ. But very often it doesn't do either of those things, right? People come in and when they're filling out their performance review, they're not reflecting. Um, they're trying to get through it. They feel overwhelmed. There's too much going on. They're driving through. They're prone to a ton of biases. We know all of that, recency bias, et cetera. And so there's a ton of lack of reflection. And then very often like somebody gets a, it's like, here it is, any questions? And that's where it is, rather than like, hey, let this be a moment for us to align. And so I think in the absence of that, we're not in there. And you see people moving to things like check-ins, et cetera, that hopefully push people more into those pieces. But I do agree with you, Ayana, that if you can get it right, there's something really powerful about the cadence of having a moment of, just like we were talking about, a moment in the year to sit back, to celebrate what's worked well, to align on where we want to go forward. And no matter how you figure out that cadence, I what I've observed in organizations that let go is they lose some of the negative pieces, but they also do lose some of that spirit of continuous growth. Um, and I would just tell you, I've just not met that many ambitious, high achieving people who don't want a regular point to understand how am I doing on this race? Because I want to get better. Um, mm -hmm. there, those, those are my views, but Anne, I'd, I'd love to hear from you given the range of companies that, that you support. Yeah, I mean, gosh, there's so much. This is a whole separate webinar, right? Performance <laughs> reviews and feedback conversations. And it is so, it's so high skill, right? To do it effectively. And, um, you know, I think, I always imagine the best kind of performance review is one where you're kind of shoulder to shoulder with someone and it's more of a coaching conversation as if my sibling or best friend is really saying, hey, you're awesome at this. This is how you can get better. And I love Thomas, your point about let's get a line on what we really value right now, because you may be killing it in one area, but actually this is what's more important, right? So let's get aligned here. So that, that framing that, you know, moment to get aligned, to kind of refocus on priorities is incredibly powerful. Totally agree. Um, I'll just add, I think incorporating values into these conversations is probably underutilized. And this is some drumbeat that I, I commonly can always come back to the values. Talk about how we're expressing them. How are we living them in action? What are some actual stories, tangible stories where I, I caught you doing something good or I caught you you know, expressing this core value of ours. Let's celebrate that for a moment, you know, tying it back to celebration. And I think if you frame it up in that way, it can be really powerful to not just talk about, yeah, you do this well, you could work on this, but how it fits in the context of this organization and what we value here and how we want to show up for each other. So, And I love that you brought that up. We actually just added that to our performance reviews this year. Um, and there was some build up reasons as to why we chose to do that. But what we were finding is that while, you know, as a startup right now, we're looking for people with the skill set. Do you have the right skill set? Because we need to move fast. We need to move quick. But as we became a scale up, it became, oh, yes, they had the great skill sets, but were they living our values? Were they driving? Was this the culture that we wanted to influence? Were they? And so there's a combination of two. And even though during the hiring process, you listen for both, something happens where the work becomes more important than how we're treating our people. And we are like, no, let's bring the values back in. And we're going to remind people we're holding you accountable, not just to your KPIs or OKRs or what have you, or your metrics, but also how you show up in the organization. That's just as important because we're all responsible for this culture that doesn't live with just the people team or this you know, executives or so forth. So I love that you brought that up. Yeah, no high performing jerks allowed. And I think we've all seen them. We've all worked with them. So <laughs> got to put that out in the open. Right. The last um, thing I like tag in on this one, clearly too passionate about the performance review piece, um, but it's just kind of to, to let like to the cat out of the bag or something, I think we probably don't admit enough, certainly I know in, in, in the worlds I've been in in talent, is that performance reviews are not an objective measure of the quality of a person. They are a subjective description of the intersection between a person's skills and values a manager's needs and business priorities and an organizational culture and vision and goals. And the same person 
you change two of those pieces and it'll look completely different. And so I think sometimes what feels so hard and tense in these conversations is it, it, it literally feels like a grade on your, on your professionalism or your professional career. But I certainly know they've been environments where I've absolutely thrived and they've been other environments where I've not shown up as my best. And the performance review reflects all of those pieces. And so my biggest wish just for all of us is the freedom for that in the conversation especially for the moments that feel harder, um, because I think then it just like opens up our ability to have an honest conversation that doesn't feel punitive um, in terms of where we are. So I know that's a bit off to center, but always feels important wanna, as we think about celebrating. No, I wanna add on to what you're saying. We also start to do calibrations. And so what calibrations did is as we calibrate, it also helped to kind of remove exactly what you were saying, which is, is this, is this, is this, person not thriving because maybe they're in the wrong role, not because they're not the mm -hmm. right for the organization or, but they're in the wrong role or they're under the wrong leader. Or let me hear how this leader is saying or looking at people across the board. And are we looking at people correctly in the same way? Mm -hmm. And are we being fair in how, what we, what's re considered performance is that across the board, the same at each level? Are we holding people accountable for directorship, which you really nicely through too? You know, like there's all these mm -hmm. moving parts. And so that helped to identify moments like that where, no, this person's great. I would never want to leave them, you know, want them to leave our organization. We may just have them in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And that brings up another great question. So for tenured employees and re-engaging those folks, um, that have been in an organization organization for two plus years. How do you approach, you know, productive conversations around re-engaging them? Go talk to them. It's, I, I know it sounds so simple and so basic, but it literally be like, hey, you've been here for a little, you know, you <laughs> behind the scenes you do your reports and you know and you know you know on average these type of people are not are leaving at this time based, based on tenure things like that so now you've done the grunt work and then you just go talk to them hey what's going on you know um now that's easier at the smaller organizations of course but if you do it enough times and you, you start to see a, a pattern or a trend and what is it that motivates you what keeps you here now there's some research that says if a person's here longer than x amount of years they're staying whether happy not happy so forth they're staying so you're like great what you don't want to do is ride that horse. The same, thing, I'm not going anywhere. So, because quite often they get a lot of pressure of you have the historical knowledge, you've been here, you know, so long, and we know you're not going anywhere. Oh, you're the reliable one. So we need to focus on the fires. Mm. We need to focus on them as well. We need to remember that yes, they're the reliable one, and yes, they may not need as much hand holding or attention, but they deserve it. And so, intentionally, go talk to them and go find out what they need. Big fan of state interviews. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I love that. That's a good point. Um, so for resourcing your leaders, what are key pillars of continual manager and executive training to ensure they are keeping a pulse on the well-being of their teams? And I think this does tie in a little bit to these to these re-engagement conversations. But how do you know that your managers and executives are, are keeping a pulse on the well-being of their teams? My answer is the same. I talk to them. <laughs> I just talk to them. Um, you know, and sorry, I don't want to take over if someone else has a way better answer than that. Um, you know, with the executives, what you know, I think it's our job in the people team, right? Really, so, so in the people space, we're kind of right in the middle. We're in this gray area. We're not revenue generating. We're not even necessarily revenue supporting per se. We're the ones that kind of support everyone in there. So we get to hear the nuances that most people don't hear. And so now you use this, and then you start speaking to your leaders or your execs. And if they're not aligning, or they're not aware, or they're not at least have an inkling, something's wrong there. There's clearly a lack of communication happening and so you just talk to them hey did you know this is going on you need to keep an eye on this and you continue to have those open ended conversations and then also respect that you can't be everywhere every time this is a personal mistake i've made where i'm like i want to be in the weeds and i want to talk to everybody and i also need to coach the executives over here and i need to remember about middle manager and you can't the truth of the matter is you can't and so it's understanding who needs your attention where? And then how do you fill those gaps? It doesn't mean that the other areas don't get your attention. It's how do you fill those gaps to make sure that they're still working and getting the information they need to keep it moving forward. I'll just chime in with some other data. I know we started this conversation with some data, but um, Indeed's World Happiness Report uh, focused on kind of all the key drivers of well-being and happiness at work. And the top 
which really stood out overwhelmingly was belonging, flexibility, and inclusion. And interestingly, those are not the top three when you ask leaders what they think is important <laughs> for contributing to our well being. So, belonging, flexibility, and inclusion. Um, the other interesting stat there is 87% of leaders believe that happiness is a key driver for differentiating their organization, and yet only 35% make it a strategic priority. So I think it comes down to, is leadership really prioritizing the levers that we know will lead to a better culture of well-being and happiness? And if it's not a strategic priority, how can we get there, right? How can we kind of move it up the value chain so that we're actually focusing on these things? And then practically speaking, how do we actually move the needle on all these different dimensions? Um, so I, I just found that research really fascinating. Yeah, I think the, the, the piece I, I kind of add, and it's like plus one to everything that was said, is what I found certainly, and, and this really starts to work at, at slightly larger scales, but ultimately people move what they're measured on. If you don't measure your leaders on the engagement in their org, I don't expect your leaders to prioritize that. There's a bunch of other stuff you're measuring and, and compensating them on. I can't tell you how many boards claim it is diversity is a priority on their executive teams. I'm like, uh, whose who's income at the end of the year is changed if that exec team doesn't achieve it? But like, I know well, growth is a priority. Are you growing? Yep. I know EBITDA is a priority. Is that happening? Yeah. So at some point, um, we have to be honest, I think, as a leadership team about what we really want. I think one of the hard things in the world of people is because the things that we work on are so nice. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have difficulty and our stakeholders have difficulty being honest about where they sit on the priority list. And um, because of that, with something like engagement, I'll, uh, who's gonna say that they don't value engagement? But I'm like, if you're not measuring it, and if that doesn't somehow tie into how you measure the performance of your leaders, then it isn't a priority. Um, and, you know, we're often working this uphill battle. I saw one of those questions um, that, that came in um, on the Q&A around motivating blue collar employees and, and figuring that out. And I hope we're able to get to it. But I think very often HR is given this impossible job of trying to make the things that the executive team is not prioritizing somehow feel prioritized to the organization. And I firmly reject that thesis. I'm like, let's have that conversation and, and make it real. And if it's not real, it's not. Easier said than done. Um, but I also want to be realistic around what you can and can't do based on what your leadership team has chosen to own. I want to plus one that, Thomas. I think it's it's those of us who are, you know, uh, HR practitioners practitioners, excuse me, in any level, it's for us to speak up and not come up to the table always just with the happiness and the fun. Like we have to come with the real, like here's the real, you you, you want a great conversation, you want a great company, here's the real behind that. And so it's a lot of difficult conversations and it's a lot of ugly conversations with people who are typically used to being in power, in, in the chair of power and not used to being told, yeah, that's cute, but you're not doing it right. And so it's, it's how do you build that relationship and how do you fight that good fight for the behind the scenes that you know you're really not going to get um, appreciated for on any side because, but you do it because it's the right thing to do and it's what we're here to do, but it's really to facilitate those different difficult conversations and in doing that it will almost all of these questions that we've spoken about will need to have that difficult conversation, a true authentic conversation to be successful. Great. Thank you for everyone for, for answering my questions. And um, I just want to spend a few minutes here at the end um, with a call to action. So let's just go around and spend a few minutes each. And if there's anything that, that you wanted to mention um, when on this webinar, or if you have a call to action for folks listening who, who want to engage and empower and celebrate their team, what do you have to say to those individuals listening? And Anne, we'll, we'll start with you. Your top okay, left. call to action. There are many. We've covered so many calls to action. Um, I, I've got to say, focus on the why. You know, start with that organizational purpose. Make that clear and crisp, and make sure that you're all aligned on what that purpose is. Uh, I'd also say, talk more about values. You know, we don't do it enough. You know, we kind of say we check the box on values, but then it never comes up in conversation. I mean, think about all the different parts of the employee life cycle where values can be expressed. 
you know, in our work together in meetings and feedback conversations and, um, you know, just it's limitless. Um, and then the third thing is, is keeping it really personal. We touched on that, uh, really getting to know the individual needs and motivators of your team members and then celebrating their uniqueness. And that's what makes our company so great is this collection of diverse, interesting, eclectic people that's going to drive the business forward. And uh, we need to celebrate that. Um, I would say put on your oxygen mask first would be my <laughs> biggest call to action. Um, are you feeling engaged? Are you feeling empowered? Are you feeling celebrated? And if not, what do you need um, from your organization and from yourself to get there? You know, the, the reason that they tell us to put your oxygen mask on first is because your instinct, especially as a parent, would be to try and help your little kid. But typically what happens if the um, airplane is low pressure, you're likely to pass out before you ever get it on their faces. And then we have two people who are passed out. And we just have too many people leaders, especially given the crazy last two and a half years we have, who are burnt out, exhausted, justifiably frustrated, and still from that place trying to figure out how to give more to their orgs. I just wanna encourage you that probably one of the most selfless things you can do for your org if you're in that place is figure out what you need to get to 100 because you in that stage is exactly what your org is going to need to build up the culture that it feels engaged in part and celebrated it. Wow, I don't know how to top those two and I personally probably needed to hear both, but um, <laughs> again, my call to action is always the same no matter what I talk about. Um, remain authentic, remain yourself. Remember that you were chosen to be part of an organization, a group, a team based off of your truth and who you were. So don't, afraid, don't be afraid to do that. And then facilitate the conversations. I don't want to call them difficult conversations because it puts this negative connotation on it. Have the conversation. A lot of times that conversation sounds way worse in your head than it does in reality. Um, so, and then authentically and respectfully have that conversation. Be true, tell your truth, share your truth and demand the same respect from the person with you in that conversation so you can get to somewhere where you can move forward. All such incredible insights. Um, attendees, thank you so much for being here with us today. Again, we have three of our incredible advisors from People Tech Partners here today. And thank you again for All Voices for putting this on. Um, I think this is gonna be a recorded webinar, which is great. Um, so check that out on their website. All Voices is an incredible platform, part of the People Tech portfolio as well. So feel free to connect with Anne or Thomas or Ayana if you have anything else. And I know a lot of you are People Tech yourselves. So thank you for coming and joining us here. Bye, everyone. Bye, folks. <laughs>